This is the new 2023 Genesis GV60, and it's really weird and futuristic. The GV60 is a small luxury crossover that's electric, which isn't really all that weird, but it has some very interesting quirks and features that distinguish it from basically anything else on sale. And today, I'm going to review the GV60 and show you what I mean. Before I get started, be sure to check out Cars and Bids, which is my enthusiast car auction website for cool cars from the modern era with free listings. You can list your cool car for free and auction it on Cars and Bids with no fees. And we've had some great sales recently, including this Mercedes S65 AMG, which sold for $75,000, this fantastic Toyota Land Cruiser that sold for just over $35,000, and this wonderful BMW. BMW 3 Series wagon, which brought almost $28,000. We love wagons on cars and bids. If you're looking to buy or sell a cool enthusiast car from the modern era, the 1980s and up, Cars and Bids is the place to do it, with daily auctions and great selection at carsandbids.com. So let's talk GV60. Like I said, electric luxury small crossover and pricing starts around $60,000. That means competitors include the Volvo XC40 Recharge, the Tesla Model Y and the Model 3, and maybe luxury versions of the Ford Mustang Mach-E or Kia EV6. But really, this is a luxury brand model with some rather interesting quirks and features and today I'm going to show them to you. First, I'll take you on a thorough tour of the GV60 and show you all the weird stuff. Then I'll get it out on the road and drive it, and then I'll give it a Doug score. All right, I'm going to start the quirks and features of the GV60 with one of the more interesting and bizarre and unusual quirks and or features I have seen in a long time. So let's get to it. I hold in my hand here the key to the GV60. I am going to lock the doors. You can see they're locked because the door handles have folded in. The doors are locked. I have the key and I'm now going to get rid of it. The key is gone. I do not have the key on me and thus I cannot get into the locked car, of course except that I can. Take a look at this. I face the GV60, look into a specific area, tap the door handle to let it know I want to get inside, and then the door handles open, it's unlocked, and I can climb in, and I've just unlocked this car without the key. How is that possible? Well, this little sensor on the side of the car where I was staring is actually a facial recognition sensor. Before I started filming, I programmed my face to be recognized by the car, and thus you can use your face to unlock the door even when you don't have the key. And I can use my face to lock it also. Look right into the spot, press on the door handle to let the car know I want it locked, and then the doors are locked and I can walk away. No key at all, facial recognition to enter my GV60. And next up we climb inside the GV60 where we are nowhere near done with the futuristic weirdness of this car. So you're probably thinking, okay, you can use your face to unlock the doors and climb inside, but once you get in here, it's not like you can do anything. You still need the key to drive away, but you don't. Climb inside and tap your finger on this little circle on the center console and the car will detect your fingerprint and then you can press the start button and start it and drive away. I do not have the key with me when I'm doing this stuff and you can see I have successfully turned the car on and it is ready to drive if I want to shift into gear and do that. That's because I taught the car my fingerprint. That little fingerprint scanner I programmed my fingerprint in before I filmed this video and so it's ready to drive with my fingerprint at any time. This is a pretty cool idea. Tesla fans make a big deal out of the fact that their phone can be used as a key so they don't have to carry a physical key anywhere. Well, in this car, your body is used as the key. Your face to get inside and your fingerprint to start it up and then you can drive away and that is a pretty cool futuristic touch. And this car is full of pretty cool futuristic touches. Here's another one, the gear selector. Take a look in the center console. You can see R and D and below them there's like an orb in the middle. What exactly 
exactly is going on there? Well, start up the car and this orb does a complete flip and actually becomes the gear selector. And then you can move this new piece into R, N, or D by twisting it, and then you can get going. And park is a little button right in the middle. Now, when you turn the car off again and get out, the orb flips back into place. So you have a gear selector that is actually an orb when the car is at rest, and only when you have it turned on and you're ready to go does it become a normal gear selector. And there is so much more. Take a look on the steering wheel, you can see a button marked Boost. This car is the GV60 Performance, the sporty version, and it has 429 horsepower, which is a lot, but you can get even more if you press Boost. Push that and horsepower temporarily goes up to 483. So that button unlocks basically 55 horsepower, and it does so for about 10 seconds. So you're doing like a highway on-ramp, a merge, a quick pass, press boost, and you have extra power for a brief spurt, which is very cool. And when this car is in its boost mode, it can do 0 to 60 in 3.4 seconds, which is damn near supercar territory. But then again, it makes sense, almost 500 horsepower, at least for that brief period, when you push boost. Pretty cool. But anyway, like I said, this is a GV60 performance model. And before I go any further with the weird quirks and features this car, let's go through a basic overview. So this is the performance, which is the top of the line model, starts around $70,000 with 429 horses or 483 with the boost button. The base model right now is called the GV60 Advanced. It starts around $60,000 and it has 314 horsepower, and both of these versions come standard with all-wheel drive. Now, it's worth pointing out that a true base model is supposed to be coming soon that will slot even below the advanced model. That will have rear-wheel drive and around 225 horsepower, and obviously it'll be more affordable. But right now you can only get the advanced and the performance, this one. Now, also worth pointing out with the GV60 is that this is based on the Hyundai Ioniq 5, which is a new electric crossover, and the Kia EV6, which is also a new electric crossover. This is sort of a luxury version of those models. It has the luxury Genesis brand name, a nicer interior, and some features that those cars don't have, including the facial detection, the fingerprint, and extra power, because those models don't offer anything equivalent to the GV60 performance, and all all of its acceleration. Now, also worth pointing out with the GV60 is range. The advanced model has about a 250 mile range, or if you upgrade to the performance, it's about 235 miles. Neither of those range numbers is exceptionally great, but charge time is impressive. Genesis says you can charge from 10% to 80% in just 18 minutes if you find the right type of charger, which is a seriously fast charge time, not that much slower than just getting gas in a car. That's pretty cool. Also worth pointing out the initial rollout of the GV60 will only be in four states, California and then a few states in the New York area, before it goes national and it's available everywhere. I suspect that's likely due to supply constraint. Genesis wanted to prioritize the places where it would likely sell the best. But since I've now covered the basics, let's go back to the interesting quirks and features of the GV60, starting with the key, which is this. It looks very odd, this sort of white, puffy thing. It almost reminds me of one of those NFL practice stadiums, like a puffed up dome situation. <laughs> That's sort of like what this key looks like. Very bizarre key design for this vehicle. And there's more bizarre in this interior. The center console, you can see, looks like a fairly standard center console, but beneath it, it's just a hole that's open all the way from the back seat to the very front center of the car, completely open. Obviously, you can use it for storage, but there's not like stuff there, <laughs> like there is in basically every car. It's just an open and hold. And speaking of unusual storage in this interior, how about the glove box, which is actually just a tray. You can see I open it up and it's not like a little compartment, but a tray that pulls out where you can put stuff and then push it back into the dashboard so it can hide, which is an odd thing. And speaking of odd things in this interior, some of the trim is reflective. You can see it almost looks lighted up, but no, that's like a reflection.
selective material that they're using for some of the trim and the door panel as you can see and it's also a little bit on the seats if you look at it from the right angle very unusual reflective interior trim certainly never seen that before and speaking of the door panel another interesting item there is the power mirror control on the driver's side which almost makes it seem like a video game controller you wrap your arm around the handle and then you can adjust the mirrors with your thumb like you're playing the world's most boring video game but that really is kind of what it looks like and it's rather strange over on the passenger side that exact same spot is just a speaker since you don't need a mirror control over there and that's how they do that symmetry in this interior and next up another rather quirky item in the interior is the voice instead of an anonymous warning chime certain actions trigger a voice to come on and tell you that something is wrong for example you get out of the car stop it turn it off and leave a window down and the voice comes on take a listen at least one window is open but anyway, onto some technology-based interesting quirks in here. One is called Smart Posture Care. You access it in the infotainment system. The way it works is you enter your body's dimensions, your height, your weight, all this stuff, and then the car will recommend a seating position that is best for your posture based on what you've entered, which is crazy. You don't adjust the seat to your right spot. The car will do it for you once it knows your body's specs. Pretty crazy. And next up, another cool feature in the infotainment system is something called 3D setup. So frequently when you want to change some setting in a car, you go into all these menus, you're not exactly sure where to look or where it's buried, but 3D setup actually shows an image of the car and then you can tap on exactly what it is you want to change. Just tap on it and then you can make adjustments, which is a pretty cool way to change settings rather than going into some menu structure and trying to figure out exactly what you're looking for, which can be hard. But anyway, speaking of that center infotainment screen, let's talk through it for a second. There are some definite pros and cons. The biggest pro is obvious. It's tremendously responsive. You can tap it, swivel it, move it just like a smartphone. It's very easy, very simple to do that, very responsive to your touch, which is really nice. You also have an excellent camera system in here. You can see this exterior camera that kind of looks all around the car, almost like a drone flying around it. Kind of a cool touch and neat to see that even on a non-super luxury car. Now, with that said, one drawback of this center infotainment system, the only real drawback I can see, is the lack of a true home screen. This is your home screen, and it's just not all that comprehensive or informative, frankly. It doesn't really give you that much info, which isn't really a great situation to be in. I wish it was like three panels, like most cars, showing the most important items you want to see instead of this sort of artistic and esoteric home screen not really all that practical or great. But next up, let's move on to another screen in this interior, and that would be the one below the center screen. You have a screen for your climate controls. And although climate control screens can be controversial, this one is tremendously easy to use. Again, very responsive, very intuitive, set up exactly like you would expect. No real drawbacks here. Operates just as easy as any other car climate control system, except now it's on a high resolution screen. And of course, you have your final screen in this interior, which is the one directly behind the steering wheel, the driver's gauge cluster screen, which I would say I'm a little bit mixed about. I like the fact that it's relatively configurable relative to other previous Hyundai and Kia models that just didn't show you that much information in this screen. Now you can get better info in here, including finally it shows you what song or music or radio station is playing, which previous Hyundai and Kia models didn't do and which I was always complaining about. So that's a nice benefit here. But this system is still not tremendously configurable. It's a shame because it's a full color screen, but you can't do all that much with it. You're pretty much always stuck with what you see in the rest of the screen, and you can't get like a full color map here or night vision or anything else that might be kind of cool. It's surprisingly static for a display screen. Now, it's worth pointing out that you can adjust the info panel of that gauge cluster screen with this little touchpad on the steering wheel. You can move it left or right, up or down, and that's how you adjust that display. And the steering wheel has quite a bit of other functions too. I already showed you the boost button, which is cool 
cool, but you can also use the wheel to control your driver assist system, which has some really nice benefits. On the freeway, it's great. It'll steer for you, accelerate, brake. You can pretty much be hands off a lot of the time and the car will do all the work. Two drawbacks though. Number one, the steering wheel is capacitive touch, meaning you don't have to like jiggle it to let it know that you're still paying attention. You can just rest your hand on it, but I've noticed your grip has to be pretty tight. You can't just tap your hand on it. It has to be kind of like hard around the steering wheel, which is kind of annoying. Also worth pointing out, this driver assist system doesn't make lane changes for you. So you put your blinker on in some cars that'll change lanes, not so in this one. It will just kind of follow the lane that you're in, which is fine, but more and more cars are starting to offer that. But anyway, next we climb into the back of the GV60, and I gotta say, it is huge back here. Now, it might not look all that huge, because my knees are sort of close to the front seat, my head is sort of close to the ceiling, but this is a tiny vehicle, only 177 inches long, considerably shorter than a Honda CRV. And in that car, I'm kind of pushed up against seats, don't have all that much space. This is smaller, but it has more room. So for this type of vehicle, it really is huge huge back here, and I'm impressed with the interior room. Now, the way they're able to do this is they don't have an engine in front, so they can kind of move the wheels out in the car and prioritize more space in the passenger compartment, and that's exactly what they've done. And it's really a surprisingly good packaging and good-sized interior in here with a lot of space. But there are also some interesting quirks worth noting in the rear seat area, starting on the door panel where you have a cup holder, which is kind of unusual. Cup holders in vehicles like this usually come come from the back of the center console, but remember, it's hollow, completely open to the front, so there's no fold-down area where you could have a cup holder, and so you have one on the door instead, which is kind of neat to see. You also have a built-in sunshade here, which is kind of cool. It's not power, but you lift up on this tab, clip it in place, and then you have a sunshade for rear passengers, which is nice to see. Also back here, heated rear seats, which is a nice luxury touch. Not all that unusual, but still worth pointing out. And USB-C ports for the rear passengers. You can see them here, which is nice for device charging. And speaking of charging stuff back here, if you look on sort of the base of the rear seats in front of it, you can see a household style power outlet is back here too. So if you want to plug in like a laptop to work while you drive, you can do that in the back of your GV60. And on that subject, one rather unusual thing back here, the rear passengers can control the position of the front passenger seat. You can see these little switches on the side of the front passenger seat can move it, can move the backrest forward, can move the entire seat forward in case the rear passenger wants more room. Now, this is a commonly seen thing on chauffeur-driven vehicles. Rolls Royces, Bentleys, nice Mercedes will have this. It's kind of strange to see it in a compact crossover where you're probably not going to have a lot of chauffeur-driven passengers. So instead, you're going to have kids back here annoyingly messing with your front passenger seat. But it's an option in case you want to use the GV60 as a chauffeur-driven car. But anyway, speaking of the back of the GV60, let's get into the cargo area back here where you can see, well, it's not that great. Now, cargo space is pretty good on the floor, but the sloping roof of this car is so severe that it really does kind of hamper cargo room if you want to put in anything larger. Now, most people don't often do that, but in case you do, you're going to find yourself a little cramped back here. Now, with that said, a nice little workaround back here, there is more space under the floor. So you lift up this little handle here and you can see a little bit more space for items under the floor or you can just pull out the floor entirely which gives you a couple extra inches of putting stuff in which could help you with the sloping roof line. Now speaking of the cargo floor one other cool trick it can do there's a little door over on the side and you can lift up the cargo floor from this area too which allows you access to more under the floor. The benefit here is that if you have some larger item taking up most of your space near cargo area and you don't want to lift it out just to get into the floor access, there's this little door that gets you in on the side, which is a neat idea. I haven't seen that in any other cars. Now, a couple other items worth noting back here. You do have a little 12 volt outlet where you can plug in stuff. Unfortunately, no household outlet, which I like to see in cargo areas, but that's a little bit of a consolation prize. One other drawback back here, you can't lower the back seats from the cargo area. There's no button you press to drop them down automatically, but back here, there isn't even a latch you can pull to lower them, which is a little disappointing. You have to go around to the seats themselves, pull on the latch, and then put them down. Not the best to see, especially at this price point where you expect to be able to do that from the cargo area. But we can stop talking about the inside of the rear of this 
car and start talking about the outside, which is unusual. The GV60 certainly has kind of a strange shape to it, especially in back. This teardrop shape is very distinctive and very different from the Ionic 5 and the EV6. You would never really think these cars were related unless you knew. And the GV60 certainly has an interesting and eye-catching look with an unusual overall design. And there are some strange design details in this car as well. Like, for example, the trim on the side, which makes this jagged pattern, as you can see. Sort of a weird zigzag on the side of the car. Not what you'd expect, but that's what it has. Now, you also have this rear spoiler back here, which kind of bisects the lower part of the rear glass. And you can see from inside the car, you're looking out through the rear spoiler because you can see above and below it, which is certainly an odd design detail you don't see all that often. But stranger than that is the fact that the third brake light is on the rear spoiler spanning the entire way across the car. So you put on the brakes, you can see that massive third brake light, long, thin line going the entire width, which is kind of an unusual touch. But anyway, next up we move on to the front trunk. This car has a front trunk since there's no engine up here. It leaves them a little extra room for storage, and you can access it by pulling this latch in the driver footwell, just like a hood release in most normal vehicles. But once you do that, then you're in this position, and you can pop this open, and then you can see there is yet another piece you have to open, this plastic panel. Open it up, and there is your front trunk. Now, it's worth pointing out, this is a small front trunk. Not very large, not big enough for much aside from papers, or maybe a very small bag, but that really kind of makes sense. I've been talking to more and more automakers about front trunks, and they tell me their market research shows most people don't actually use them. So I'll put up an electric car review where it doesn't even have a front trunk, and people say, that's ridiculous, it's so terrible, so impractical, but the truth is most people aren't really using these front trunks. The cargo space in back is more than good enough. This is just a little extra bit, and I'm sure this will be fine for most uses. Now, the other interesting thing up front is the headlight situation. When you look at this car with the headlights off, you can see there are basically five bricks in each headlight assembly, and there are two assemblies on each side. So 10 total bricks, five in each piece, which is kind of strange. And it gets even stranger when you turn on the headlights, four of the bricks light up, the four innermost. So two on top and two on bottom, and those are your headlights. Turn on the turn signals, and the three outer bricks light up on both top and bottom. So six bricks across two clusters light up for your turn signals and four for your headlights. It's a very strange look when everything's on and certainly distinctive to this car, but that's the lighting situation in the GV60. And next up, another interesting quirk relates to the charging situation with the GV60. So this is the charge door. To open it, you just tap on it, it pops open, and then this is where you can plug in your GV60 to charge it. Pretty simple, but there's an interesting quirk. All GV60 models come with this little zippered pouch. You can see it here. You open it up and you have this unusual attachment. What you do is you take the attachment and plug it into the charge port, and then you can open up the other side and there is a household power plug. So you can use your GV60 to charge some sort of device when you're out somewhere without access to a charger. Or you can do what I'm doing and really exploit things and plug in an entire power strip and charge a lot of devices. But either way, pretty cool idea to be able to charge stuff from your car, not just charge your car. And so those are the quirks and features of the new 2023 Genesis GV60. Now it's time to get it out on the road and see how it drives. All right, driving the new GV60. Um, first things first, I really liked the Kia EV6 and the Hyundai Ioniq 5 on which this car is based. I thought they were great. Um, but this car definitely takes things up a bit. I will say it doesn't quite take things up a bit as much as I was expecting. So the Genesis GV70 is their other little crossover, gasoline powered, and the interior in that car is fantastic. Absolutely beautiful Porsche, Mercedes-Benz quality, one of the very best compact luxury crossover interiors that I've been in, period. 
This car isn't like that. It has sort of a funky, weird interior vibe, but it doesn't have like an ultra luxury interior vibe. So the GV70, the GV80 have kind of cultivated this reputation for like a crazy high quality interior. This car doesn't quite have it. Now it's very nice in here. It looks great, but it's not quite like ultra luxury, like some of the other Genesis models sort of punching above their weight class. But maybe more importantly, let's talk through Boost. It's, oh no, oh my God. <laughs> Woo this car is fast with boost engaged, like unusually fast. And I say that zero to 16 3.4 is not that crazy for an electric car, which sounds insane, but that's the truth. Some of these electric cars are doing three seconds, two and a half, even normal family type cars. The cool thing here is this is like a compact crossover. Like this isn't some high dollar Model X plaid sort of situation. This is a relatively rational, normal car that you would see driving around in like most neighborhoods. And it does zero to 60 and three, four. Boost is on and I'm going. Now they say there's a limit to the number of times that you can do boost like right in a row, but I haven't seen it. <laughs> and even without boost, it's fast. Like this thing is still fast, 420 horsepower, whatever it was. Like it is really quick with or without boost. This thing just moves. Now, I mentioned the interior is not quite as nice as uh, some of the other Genesis models, other high-end luxury vehicles, sort of more funky EV than like really high quality. And that is true. I will say the driving experience is, it's very luxurious in here, very quiet, very comfortable, surprisingly so, considering you don't have that interior bump up. It's actually a little bit discordant. The interior is sort of like normal, weird, cool electric car, but the driving experience is nice. It's a very comfortable, quiet ride. You don't hear all that much on the outside, which is nice, um, kind of a hallmark of luxury electric cars. They cancel out a lot of the outside noise, even without an engine to help them kind of minimize that noise. They're still very quiet. And this car certainly feels like that. Now, as far as steering and handling, I had the chance to take this car on some uh, kind of curvy back roads and it's not great at that. This is not, I wouldn't call this a luxury sport performance crossover. It certainly feels like that in a straight line, but in terms of like going around corners and really feeling engaged, the steering is quick enough, which is a lot of electric vehicles do that, I think to try to cover for the fact that the handling isn't that great. And that's sort of the situation here. You've got a lot of weight low in the car, like you do in a lot of EVs, but it's just distributed in a way that makes it feel kind of slow to take corners. And that's especially true given it's, uh, uh, size. This is not a very big vehicle, but it feels bigger than it is when you're going around corners. It's just sort of a little bit slow and a little bit effortful to go around corners and doesn't really have like a true sporty feel. Certainly the acceleration is a lot sportier than the handling in this vehicle, which frankly is true of a lot of electric cars. Really overall, I think there's a lot of great stuff to like about the GV60. Uh, would I get one over an EV6 or an Ionic 5 considering they're all kind of based on the same stuff and use similar tech? The answer is yes, but only if I got the performance model. Base level, GV60s with the same powertrain as the Ionic 5 and the EV6. I don't think you're quite getting enough in terms of interior, in terms of comfort and luxury, but if you get this performance model, that isn't available on the Ionic 5 and the EV6 yet, although my understanding is it might be coming, but for now, it's exclusive to this car, and that makes it a pretty appealing vehicle. You can just stomp on the throttle and it has some nice performance, and you do get some other nice benefits like the uh, facial recognition, the fingerprint thing. Those are kind of stupid, but they're also somewhat useful you don't have to bring a key with you anymore. And I found both of those things worked 100% of the time. There was no glitchiness with either of them. So that was kind of impressive. Overall, I would say great car, not quite as luxury as I was expecting from Genesis, but the performance is excellent. The tech is good. And it's a cool new EV that I think people looking for a cool new EV are gonna be very interested in. And so that's the new 2023 Genesis GV60. This is a rather interesting and unusual and very quirky vehicle and it's certainly been cool to check it out and see all the weird stuff it certainly has well some quirks but i think it's going to appeal to electric car shoppers who want something different with some new cool tech that other rivals don't have anyway now it's time to give the gv60 a doug score And the Doug score is here, 67 out of 100, which places the GV60 pretty high in the list of electric cars I've reviewed, and with good reason, as acceleration is impressive, technology is excellent, and practicality is strong, among other benefits. With that said, I still think a Mustang Mach-E GT or a Model Y performance is a better overall choice, as they're more well-rounded vehicles and they have better styling. But the GV60 is compelling, and it has some neat tricks you won't find in other cars. 